The presentation this morning is, can you read it for me? Are you free to choose? At the beginning, let me take you a little bit to the left. I'll be discussing two very interesting features about God. First of all, I would like to uphold and elevate and proclaim the supremacy of God in the universe. I believe, as a creationist, that this world did not come about by blind chance. The universe, the stars, galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, and all the heavenly bodies are all the creation of God. The universe has a point of beginning in time. And today we are part of this universe. I believe that this God is omnipotent. He can do all things. You remember the words spoken uh, by God to Jeremiah. Is there anything too hard for me? God says. God is omnipotent. He proclaims it. And he proves it in the Bible. So many times. God is omnipresent. He fills the whole universe with his presence. He's everywhere. Invisibly. Even his son. Jesus Christ. The divine son of God said. When he departed from this world. He said I am with you. What? Always. Even until the end of the age. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. He knows all things. You remember the words of Jesus when he spoke to his disciples and, giving, and, give, uh, and gave them instructions uh, in Matthew chapter 10. He said, even the hairs on your head are what? Are numbered. You know, my wife, in recent times, you know, Elena, she started to accompany me as I go to the hairdresser. Uh, because I like short haircuts. I don't know why. From childhood. I like my hair to be cut short. And, uh, and I want to look uh, very sporty. All right, let's put it this way. I want to look sporty. And I also have a big head. So if I cut more hair, my head will look more normal. Uh, because my parents always struggled finding the right hat for me because my head was too big. Uh, my wife in recent times said, Vadim, you're going to go have a haircut. I'll go and instruct uh, the barber to give you the right haircut. He actually, she actually doesn't allow me to cut my hair anymore. She says, okay, on the sides you may cut it, you know. And I, and I whisper to the uh, hairdresser, please cut it one and a half on the sides. I like it short. But on the top, my wife doesn't let me cut my hair because she said, Vadim, you're growing bald. You, did you notice that? Uh, there on the back, you are... Uh, getting some boldness and all the sides. So Helen says, well, and she tells the hairdresser, uh, who is our good friend, she comes from Sri Lanka, and uh, she said, please don't cut his hair length at all, because I want to cover his boldness here and there so that he would look better. Well, the Bible says, God knows every hair on your head, whether it's there or not. He is omniscient. God is never changing. You remember the words of God spoken to uh, Malachi, in Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord and I never change. His son was spoken of in Hebrews 13 verse 8, that Jesus Christ yesterday, today, and uh, for, uh, forever is the same. God is, uh, the whole book uh, expresses and narrates and describes the personality of God. The Bible is the most fascinating awesome and incredible book in the world because it talks about the maker of the universe describes him from different angles and this book is the self-revelation of God to his creation his letter to you and me and today I as I said at the beginning want to elevate very high the supremacy of God in the universe. We, know, we will never know where God comes from. Even in eternity we will not be able to understand that. God is infinite. He has no beginning and no end. Here is the one who is above space and time. Here is incredible. We will be spending all eternity learning more about him. 
but will never know the fullness of God. Because it's, he, God is incomprehensible. And uh, we will try to penetrate into his personality. And ask him to tell us a lot about him. And I think even if he tells us a lot, we will still not be able to understand everything. All we have to do is just accept the existence of God in the universe. The fact that the universe was created. And the fact that God has the ultimate and final authority over his creation. That's what you find in this book. God, in his supreme will, chose the universe to be made. He made the universe according to his will. He made this planet by his desire. We are, you and I, are the product of God's choice. God made Adam and Eve. So today, when you read the Bible, you find that God is supreme. He is awesome. He is undescribable. He is amazing. On the other hand, looking at these physical, so to say, features of God, we in the Bible learn about his character. Biblical stories and narratives, proverbs and parables, symbols and prophecies, the description of the life of Christ in the Gospels, they all tell us about the character of God. On one hand, we know that God is a righteous judge. In fact, the book of Revelation shows us the grand finale of the history of mankind as the final judgment. God, Hebrews, a letter to Hebrews says, He is the devouring fire. He is the one who has ultimate energy in Him. Just think about how much energy you have in God. Take, for instance, an atom. An atom is an elementary particle uh, discovered by, in theory by the ancient Greek scientists. And now we know for sure because now we have the microscope and we can even see the atom and split the atom. Every time you split an atom, there is a lot of energy released, nuclear energy. You can even split the proton. And you may be splitting the atom multiple times. Did you know that one kilogram of uranium, and uranium is highly radioactive, and that is why it's easy to split uranium uh, under special circumstances, one kilogram of uranium will produce the same amount of energy as 2,000 train carriages of coal. Just think about it. Just imagine a long train with 2,000 carriages with black coal. And imagine how much heat that would generate if you burn it all. Just one kilogram of uranium has that amount of energy. One nuclear submarine is capable of submerging itself and being underwater for 25 years. That's the capacity of the nuclear reactor in a nuclear submarine. When I visited one nuclear submarine many years ago, I saw a nuclear reactor. It was very small. It was probably uh, a third of the size of this stage, the heart of the submarine. And it can drive the submarine, a giant vessel, an underwater ship, submerged for 25 years, fully autonomous, providing food, oxygen, everything for the survival of sailors inside. Can you imagine if God put so much energy into an atom, and we're all consistent of atoms, all of us as humans, uh, consisting of water and carbon and many other uh, minerals, we contain a lot of physical energy in us. Just think about the amount of energy which God has. Today, I will repeat myself many times. I elevate the supremacy and the final authority of God in the universe. At the same time, in the Bible, you and I read about God's character. And the first line that comes to the mind of anyone who once found Jesus is that God is love. 1 John 4, 8. God is love. And in the Bible, you find multiple features about God, that he is caring. You remember the words of, uh, of David in Psalm 23, where he, uh, the shepherd himself says, The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He will provide for me. 
Jesus says, I am a good shepherd in John chapter 10. In the Bible, you find God who is very caring. He's full of love. Here, he's full of forgiveness. You find in the second commandment, and by the way, a lot of people ask me, where in the law of God, in the Ten Commandments, do you find the character of God? Well, it's very clear in the second commandment, where it says that God gives his blessing for how many generations? Those who love him and keep his commandments. For a thousand generations. But God's judgment will last only for until how many? The third and the fourth generation. Which means that God's mercy, benevolence, are at least 250 times greater than his justice god is very merciful of course god is not a doormat you, uh, that you can go and wipe your feet on that's how a lot of people think about god today that god is a kind body a mate who will just uh, be somewhere and not trouble you not bother you well uh, he will not because the universe is under his control his universe this universe is is his it's his possession the universe is his property he made the universe it's his if you made something with your hands, let's say using plaster, and you put it on a shelf in your house, it's yours because you made it. God made the universe. It's his. He made it. So whether we, you want it or not, it's impossible for a human being to run away from the person of God in the universe because God will always be there. He made the universe and he will always be there. But at the same time, God, in his supremacy and final authority, is full of love and care. He gave to his creation something that was very risky, but at the same time shows how noble and how wonderful he is. He gave you and I freedom to choose. Yes, a lot of people will say, but wait a minute. Don't we see in the New Testament that uh, God actually is deciding everything for us? For instance, can you open Philippians 2.13 for us, for me? Philippians 2.13. Having had a doxology elevating Christ and his sacrifice on the cross in the previous verses, uh, Paul, talking to Philippians, says, Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you both the, to will and to do for his good pleasure. Did you hear what the Bible says? It is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So some people may say, well, maybe even uh, my will is the product of God's choice. We know that in the ancient pagan world, in some pagan cultures... And sometimes, even in some Christian circles, people take the supremacy and the final authority of God to the ultimate extreme by saying, well, in fact, we have no choice. God decides everything for us. If he decided that you will spend eternity with him, that's what will happen. And you'll never be able to resist. You will do it just because God will create a will, a desire in you to do it. If God decided that you will be lost forever, you will be lost regardless of what you think and do. So that's what some people think. And uh, this concept takes the person of God and his supremacy and his authority to the very extreme. It reads the universe and human beings and angels of their choice. Well, in the Bible... You read everything in context. You read everything that you find in the scriptures. And uh, Michael Moyer, uh, uh, Michael, I think yeah, I will not be surprised that when you grow up, you'll be a minister and you'll preach the gospel of Christ. Because uh, whenever you come to the stage, I always think about that. One day you might come back here to Pakenham and be the pastor of this church. Let's see what happens, okay? Maybe Jesus will come sooner and that will not happen. But if it happens, I give you a warning in advance. Accept him with love. You remember the people of Israel in Exodus as they traveled from Egypt to the promised land and God asked them to locate themselves on two mountains. One mountain will be the mountain of curses and the other mountain will be the mountain of what? Of blessings. 
And God said, well, if you disobey my commandments, this is what will happen. And they were to recite. They were to read out loud all the curses that will happen to them if they do not follow God. Uh, that they will go into captivity, that they will be financially bankrupt, they'll have uh, spiritual, physical, emotional uh, uh, health, everything will go broke in their lives if they do not follow God. So that was the mountain of curses. The other mountain was the mountain of blessings. God said, well, if you follow me and keep my commands, this, uh, this is what is going to happen to you. You'll live a long life. You'll enjoy life. Your children will be blessed. You will, uh, you will lend and will not borrow. You will uh, be living happily forever in the land of milk and honey. So God took two mountains, placed the people of Israel on those mountains and made them proclaim the blessings and curses, uh, and curses out loud. Later in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses would repeat in just one phrase, which Michael read for us, Deuteronomy 30 verse 19. He said, God says, today I give you a choice, life and death. And then God says, choose what? Choose life. In uh, the final exodus, in the New Testament era, during God's delivery of his children from the world of sin and taking them to the world of righteousness and eternal truth, his kingdom, in the book of Apocalypse, you find two well-known verses. It's Revelation 3, verse 20. Could you look at, with me at Revelation 3, 20? Behold, I stand at the door and what? Knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he, what? With me. Jesus is talking about himself uh, knocking on the doors of the hearts of the Laodiceans, the Laodicean church, the church of the last days. And here Jesus comes to the door and knocks. And he says, if anyone hears my voice and what? Opens the door. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. And in the New Testament times, having a dinner was not like going to McDonald's for a short meal and running away back to work. In biblical times, dining was staying with a person, eating long, having fellowship, sometimes spending a few days. That was, that's how long dinners were in those days. I wish I could have a dinner a week long. And uh, then I would have to fast at least for one week and exercise rigorously to burn all the calories I've eaten. But in the biblical times, they were not concerned. They, their diet was so low calorie, they didn't have any trouble with that. But they, Jesus says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. Look at one more verse, Revelation 22, verse 17. Again, a passage which all of you know very well. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life. How? Freely. Everywhere in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, almost in every book, all we, we can see is that God will create the most favorable circumstances for you and me to know him. He will Take the people of Israel out of Egypt with miracles. He'll part the waters of the sea. He'll shower manna from heaven for 40 years. He'll give them water from the rock. He will heal their diseases. He will make sure that even their clothes and their shoes would not wear out. God would create the most favorable circumstances for them to see that he, though invisible, is faithful. In the New Testament era, God creates all the circumstances for you and me to learn uh, about him. He leaves behind for us a canon, a book with multiple books uh, where you find the stories of ancient people. He will give us prophecy and for us uh, in the New Testament era to see the fulfillment of prophecy and see that God always keeps his word, that he is faithful, he is loving. He shows us the cross of, on Calvary. God says, I, in my great supremacy, in my authority will use every tool in the world for you to be with me. But there's one last point. One last box to be checked on the checklist. And that is your choice. I will do my best to draw you to me. 
but I will never be able to force you to follow me. Therefore, you have these conditional clauses in the Bible. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Let him who desires drink the water of life, how? Freely. God, as I said, in his supremacy will create multiple circumstances for you and me to follow him. But he will never force you and me to follow him. People ask a question, is there a stone which even God cannot lift? Yes, there is. You know what that stone is? It's a human being. Because God will never be able to twist your choice. The choice is yours. There are many things in this world which we can't choose. We can't choose not to be born. Well, the fact that you're here means that you, somebody else chose you to be born. You can't choose a place of your birth. Well, I wish I were born in Kenya, in the world's best climate. But I was born in Siberia, in the world's most unenjoyable climate. You can't choose your parents. I wish I was, I wish I were, as a child, I always told my parents, I wish I was born in Asia. Uh, and my mom laughed at me. But you and I can't choose a lot of things. There are things beyond our choices. But one thing you and I can choose, and that is your destiny. The place you will spend eternity it's your and mine choice. Is it easy to make that choice? No, it is not. I know the struggles and battles in the hearts of many who have to choose whether to follow Jesus or not to follow him. As a former atheist, as a child, I grew up in the complete absence of God and Christ. And for me, when I heard the gospel message, I had a lot of doubts in my mind. Did God ever exist? Because I can't see him. Can I trust the Bible if I was taught for so many years it was a collection of myths and fairy tales? It was a fable. Could I actually believe in the resurrection of Christ? That was another big puzzle for me because I realized that if Christ is alive, then what he said is absolute truth. And those who follow him are the happiest people in the world. But I also realized that if Christ is not alive... And if he died and never rose again, then the Christians who followed him, billions of them in the past 2,000 years, are the most miserable people in the world because they believed a lie. I, ha I was uh, also struggling with my choice of a church. Because at first I chose, like most Russians do, to be baptized in the Orthodox Church where I was baptized a year before I became an Adventist. And for me... To consider Adventism was also a struggle because they were so different. They ate differently. They worshipped God on a different day. They did not believe in the afterlife as I believed it. They did not believe many things that I wanted to believe. I was struggling. As a teenager of 15, I was looking for answers. And I'm happy I found those answers. God does not want us to believe blindly. God does not want us to believe just for the sake of belief. Just because you came to a community where everybody is smiling and is very nice to you. It does contribute, by the way. I don't think that any church would be able to save people if it's not a loving church. What do you think? You may have the best truth in the world, but if you don't have love, you can't save. You are paralyzed. You have the right doctrine, but no right spirit. Jesus said, people will know that you are my disciples if you have what? If you have love amongst yourselves. Therefore, it is absolutely essential. It is, uh, it's, it's, it is a must. That's where, let me suggest to you, that we have no choice. We will either be a loving, caring, and attentive family to the needs of community around us and to each other, and grow in Christ. Or we'll be a community which is cold, loaded seemingly lukewarm, and will diminish, deteriorate, be sick, and die eventually. Again, 
Are you free to choose? Yes. I choose a church that is vibrant, that is dynamic, that is caring, tolerant, accepting, understanding. That's the church I choose. I choose, I choose a church where people realize that they are a bunch of sinners who all need grace and forgiveness. I don't want to be in the church which thought in himself that it is a gallery of saints and everybody should be just the same as them. I believe in the church which accepts diversity. I believe in the church which accepts different cultures, races, nationalities, age groups. I am for the church which looks like Jesus. And uh, here in the Bible, you find the plain, clear teaching that God in his love made human beings uh, in, his, in his image and likeness, and he gave you and I freedom to choose. Choosing Christ is, an, is not an easy thing. Because God in his respectfulness of atheists does not show his face to us. He gives us freedom to choose him or not. And for me, it was a difficult choice. In fact, sometimes, uh, my dear friends, uh, it was back in Siberia when I was making my first steps to Christ. I would walk the street and I would cry because I, was, I did not know whether what I was studying was true or not. But I did get my answers. I did consider the world of science and realized that this universe could not make itself. The universe could not have appeared out of blindness, out of vacuum, in the complete absence of mind. This sophisticated world, the laws of heavenly mechanics, and all those things convinced me in the fact, there must be a creator. When I finally, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, realized that a lot of scientists had been, uh, had been digging in the Middle East for the 200 years, and they were looking for clay tablets, scrolls, writings, inscriptions, stones, lost cities, I came to the conclusion that the Bible is a unique historical document, backed by more than 20,000 manuscripts, which show how reliably it was copied and spread throughout the civilized world. I knew I could trust the historicity of the Bible. Biblical prophecies were a contributory factor in my decision to follow God because uh, I think prophecy is potentially the be best proof in the world that God exists because you can actually compare the words of the prophet and history. And it's not just one prophecy, it's many of them, hundreds. And finally, the last nail in the coffin of my unbelief or disbelief was the fact that Jesus rose again. There are all the circumstances that surround the resurrection of Christ are so convincing and so persuasive that I know now with confidence Jesus Christ is alive. He rose again. He is a living Savior. And if He is alive, it means that everything He said is true. Everything he said is just and right. And finally, it is wonderful to believe in Christ. Because he's such a charming personality. Look at Jesus, who touched the eyes of the blind and they saw. Who touched the ears of the deaf and they heard. Who opened the mouths of people who could never speak. Who healed the lepers, rose the dead, took little children on his hands, was the friend of the outcasts of his society, spent time with publicans and sinners. Where else will you find such a fascinating man on earth? It is so wonderful. The, the personality of Christ is so warming, so attractive, so magnetic. I could not resist. And therefore, finally I... A moment came when I just knelt in my little apartment back in Siberia. And uh, I started praying, Lord Jesus, please come into my heart. I knew I would never be able to resist him. I would follow him all my life. And that day he came into my heart. And I never regretted my choice. Was it easy? Of course not. My relatives did not understand what I did. My father used to lock me at home, not letting me go to church. He was thinking that 
I became insane. My classmates, did they understand me? No. My friends in the sports club when I was de doing boxing, they all said, well, but Dim, you're insane. Everybody in my society at that time, in the post-communist so, uh, Russian society thought I was mad by making that choice. But now, years later, after all the stresses are gone, I realize it is wonderful to live with Christ. It is wonderful to be surrounded by people who also believe in Him. I'm so happy I am here in this church today. I know that we're not perfect. All of us have problems, don't we? I have a uh, I have not the best character in the world. Ask my wife, she'll tell you the truth. She's been suffering my presence in her life now for the last 20 years. <laughs> Ask my children. But I know that I come to a company where everything is different. When we have a wedding here, our weddings are different. You know why? Because God is in the middle of those weddings. There's so much joy and hope. And uh, we don't part uh, at, uh, after the wedding, drunk, with confused minds, looking for a, uh, for a Uber or a taxi to take us home, waking up in the morning with a big headache. When we have a funeral, by the way, our funerals are the best in the world because they're, they're so full of hope. Because I've been to a lot of funerals without Christ. And there's doom and gloom. Yes, people have some good remembrances. But our funerals are different. Our weddings are different. Our families are different. Our community is different. And I choose to be a part of the community of Christ. I'd rather stay here than anywhere else in the world. It's not easy sometimes. Because often we rub shoulders uh, in our congregation. And some of our shoulders are not smooth. Some of our shoulders are very bony and sharp. But I want us to unite and stick together as one brotherhood and sisterhood of believers. We need each other in one church. We need to give each other thousands of smiles, kind words, actions of encouragement. We all need each other. And often a visitor comes and, my friend, you may, might be in the battle now whether you want to choose Christ or not. My call to you. Are you free to choose? Yes, you are. Choose Christ Jesus today. If you want to get baptized, please see me after the service today. I want to talk to you. If you want to consider Jesus, well, why don't you just try him and uh, tell him, Jesus, come into my heart for a week and let me see what happens. I can guarantee you, if you let Jesus into your heart for one day, tomorrow you will not let, uh, let him go away. You will keep him forever. Choose life. Choose life. Use your freedom of choice wisely. And spend eternity with Jesus. Amen.